here can get into rocks. Well, then you're here for the right talk. Join me in welcoming graduate student in Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington, Michael Kiff. Thank you, Brett. And thank you, astronomers and astronomy enthusiasts, for having a humble geologist out. I will try not to make a fool of myself. So here goes nothing. What if I were to tell you to forget everything that Josh told you in the last talk, and probably all of your common sense about this field of astrobiology, and if I were to tell you that we actually do have evidence of alien life, and that it is on the surface of our Earth, and it's unlike anything that we see living on our planet today. And what's more, the reason you have not heard about it is that it's sitting buried in the north woods of Russia. I'm being dead serious, and I'm not talking about this. Uh, I feel a need to defend that we are actually doing um, science here, and so I am not talking about that, but I am dead serious, I swear. What I'm talking about is this rock right here, uh, and many others like it. What you're looking at is a two billion year old stromatolite, uh, or in other words, a microbial mat made of photosynthetic microbes that grow on top of each other, it's not the, the prettiest specimen here, but this is basically a columnar stromatolite. It's growing upwards this way. Here's a hand sample of a smaller example of the same thing. You see these layers here. I've outlined them for you. These are photosynthetic microbes growing on top of each other, and they're trapping mud that is dissolved in shallow water uh, in between their cellular matrix. And this type of life, like Josh was saying in the talk before this, uh, was prevalent on Earth for much of Earth's history. In fact, almost all of it, about 90% of it. Uh, here's another example of the same thing. This is a 1.3 billion year old stromatolite. You find these things everywhere uh, if you look throughout rocks that are more than a billion years old. These have much nicer layers, and then what you're seeing is that they're thicker on the top. This is how we know it's not just some random sedimentary structure. Uh, in fact, the fact that these are thicker on the top is diagnostic, because if this was just sediment, say, filling into a little divot, it would be thicker on the sides, shallower on the top. But this sort of anti-gravity effect tells you that these are microbes that have a competitive advantage when they grow on the top of the mound, because they need sunlight to do photosynthesis. So this is just to say that when we look back at its history, the vast, vast majority of it was a of a planet that contains life unlike we see it today. And uh, just to put this sort of into a, a more quantitative context, if we're thinking about looking at planets out orbiting other stars, we're going to look at them somewhere in their period of their history. We don't exactly know where. The error bars that you saw on Josh's postcard of the uh, planets, it could be plus or minus a few billion years. And if we look at Earth's history four and a half billion years ago to today, of course, we know that humans are newcomers. We've been around on the block for less than two million years. Animals in general are also newcomers. We've only had animals on Earth's surface for about 600 million years. But we think that microbes have been around for nearly all of Earth's history, all the way back to basically the oldest rocks we can find. And this begs another question, which uh, I'm trying to pick up where the last talk left off on, which is, why was Earth a microbial planet? for the vast majority of its history. And this has to do, again, with oxygen, the thing that you and I breathe, every living animal on the surface of the Earth uses in its metabolism. We think that there was less oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere early in its history, even in its middle history, and only recently has there been a lot, and perhaps that's what limits animal life. Because what we do as animals is we use oxygen to respire carbohydrates. For instance, you eat a Crunchwrap Supreme, it's loaded with carbohydrates, amongst many other chemicals. You react it with oxygen that you breathe as you slurp through your straw and drink your Baja Blast. And you get energy, believe it or not, out of that reaction. Uh, you also produce some byproducts, and it can be potentially explosive. But I, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, Without the oxygen, you're not eating country supreme or any food, seeds, nuts, plants, whatever. 
And so what we can do is look at these inflection points in the history of oxygen and say, did one of those enable animals to persist? So the first of these uh, we call the great oxidation event. Yeah, it's extraordinarily creative. And before this point in Earth's history, we think there's essentially zero oxygen in the atmosphere, just trace, trace amounts. And we see, accordingly, evidence of microbial life. Uh, this here is another stromatolite. This one's three and a half billion years old, found in Western Australia, perhaps the oldest stromatolite on the Earth, although that is a point of contention. I will leave it to that. Now, after this point, perhaps we would get more oxygen, maybe we'd start to see more complex life, but in fact, it's more light groups all the way through, up until through this whole middle history, you can find the stromatolites. This is, again, the one that's 1.3 billion years old. And it's not until about 600 million years ago that we have an event that we sometimes call the Cambrian Explosion, or in more broad terms, the rapid diversification of animal life, where it goes from basically no animals to abundant and diverse animals. We get things like trilobites. From this point forward, all of the motile, multicellular, intelligent, and even today, blitheringly unintelligent life is only possible because of oxygen. So it is both to thank and it gives and takes. But this gives us a picture where perhaps there is some threshold, some level of oxygen that you must exceed in order to make animal life possible on a planetary surface. And it stands to reason maybe we crossed that threshold around five or six hundred million years ago. This jives very well with our fossil uh, reading of the fossil record, where the oldest animals show up right around this time, but we have microbes going back nearly as old as the Earth itself. This begs sort of two questions. Uh, the first is, given this disparity that the Earth only looked like it does today um, for a very small sliver of Earth's history, would we recognize the Earth as inhabited if we looked, say, two billion years ago? Uh, as a, for instance, a, a remote observer, say, picking the Earth just over two billion years ago, could we say, A, that it was inhabited, and B, and taking it a step further, could we say anything about whether it had complex life or not? We know, on the, in the case of the Earth, even if it didn't have, say, animal life at this point, we know it was a planet that came to support animal life. Might we miss identifying such a planet if we were to find one uh, when we were doing our remote observations? So that's a question I want to motivate the talk with. And I'm going to approach it in the following way. So, the goal here is to take what we had as a picture of this broad stroke picture of uh, atmospheric oxygen levels and try to get into the nitty gritty, get a very precise record of oxygen, and then see how that corresponds to the timing of these evolutionary events. Uh, and we have a tool for doing this. We call them redox sensitive elements. Uh, and if your blinders are going on right now, um, there's one slide to explain what that means that you can refill on a beer if you care not to listen to it. Uh, but I use clip art for the figure, so it can't be that bad. So, what is a redox sensitive element? It is, as the name suggests, an element that is only mobilized uh, during weathering the presence of oxygen. So basically, they hang out in the crust. Without oxygen, they won't be solubilized. Uh, what are some examples of them? All, all of the stuff in the middle of the periodic table that you don't probably think about except for back in high school chemistry, uh, like molybdenum, selenium, uh, uranium. Uh, you've probably thought about uranium at some point, so that's good. <laughs> now, the basic premise here is that these elements, again, they are only mobile in the presence of oxygen. And if we look at, say, marine sediments, the mud on the bottom of the ocean that collects the stuff that falls out of the ocean, we should see more of these redox sensitive elements in those sediments at times when there's a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. If there's little oxygen, there shouldn't be much. Um, again, if you're more for uh, pictograms, here they are, here are the elements in the crust. If you get weathering without oxygen, they stay put. If you add oxygen to the mix, it reacts with them, they become soluble, and they can get enriched in marine sediments. So, for those who did not pay attention, I actually, I could have just done it in one sentence, I'm sorry, but high levels of redox sensitive elements in a marine sediment means high oxygen levels in the atmosphere at that time. All right, so that's our basic premise. We're going to use that thinking, and if only we could find re uh, marine sediments that go from the modern Earth all the way back through its whole history, 
then we could just measure those elements and we should get a really nice picture of uh, oxygen levels. The problem with that is that old rocks, among them old marine sedimentary rocks, are exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Uh, how rare are you, might ask? Here is a uh, rough approximation of what the Earth looks like, if I recall, you know, not larger than Africa. <laughs> and uh, it's the best one I could find against the clip art thing. Uh, if we wanted to look at rocks that are from the first half of Earth's history, so more than two and a half billion years old, uh, we can find them in these places. And that's not too bad. I mean, there's a fair number of places. For whatever reason, they happen to be in really remote areas, uh, but that's good news to a geologist. We like to just camp out in the middle of nowhere. So that's, that's just fine. Uh, but if you just take it a step further and you go to the first one-third, roughly, of Earth's history, rocks older than three billion years, uh, it's a much more dire situation, and it gets worse and worse the further you go back. So we have these precious few archives of old rocks that we are desperately sampling to put together this history of atmospheric oxygen. And so what do we do? Like, What, what does it involve to do this work uh, as a geologist? Uh, sometimes you get to go out to the side of a mountain and you just hack off a piece of the old rock. Here's some black shale. This is formerly an organic rich marine sediment. This one's 260 million years old. Uh, it's in Wyoming. Now, this is all well and good, but usually rocks aren't exposed like this. Uh, these rocks get weathered over time, they get covered by soil and then trees and just all the stuff that a geologist doesn't want. Uh, so this, for instance, was only exposed because they built a highway and they blew uh, dynamite into the side of the mountain. So that was great. But a lot of times that's not the case. And so what we're stuck doing is we drill into the continental interior to recover these archives of ancient marine sedimentary rocks. What you're seeing here is a drilling project to recover 2.6 billion year old marine sediments. This is University of Washington professor uh, Roger Buick. Hands up because something apparently went right finally in the drilling uh, process. So that's actually a huge hassle of the, the whole enterprise, getting the samples. But then what happens? So we get them, we get these little chunks of rock, we cut them with a rock saw, you crush it into a fine powder. Then you put your fancy lab stuff on, you dissolve it in really harsh acids, you purify the element of interest, you take that solution, you put it in a fancy machine, a mass spectrometer, uh, it's tuned to give you a very precise measurement of a single element in many cases, uh, and then you get your data, you sit back and you have a beer and you think about it. <laughs> and that's what we're doing tonight. We're going to show you some data and we'll talk about it. Um, and then this could go on indefinitely sign up for something called a PhD. <laughs> but let's, let's talk about some data. So I'm going to show you three examples of elements that people have looked at to try to piece together this history of oxygen, three different studies. The first one is molybdenum. Um, I don't know why they started with that one, but they did. Uh, this is from a paper about a decade ago now, uh, published in Nature, and it was the first to really blaze this trail of taking this approach. They gathered hundreds, if not, I think, a few thousand samples spanning Earth's history, looking at the concentration of molybdenum. And what they found was pretty neat. These are their data. And you'll notice one thing that really stands out is this huge increase in the enrichment of molybdenum around, say, five or six hundred million years ago. That was when we, like I was saying at the beginning, we think that this rise to near modern oxygen levels happened. Uh, maybe you pick up on a little increase here between two and a half and two billion years ago. And in fact, this data is part of the, the framework of data that went into putting this picture together. That there is little oxygen, there is a stepwise increase, and then we reached modern levels about 600 million years ago. Recall that this one's a log scale, this one's not. So this looks huge here, but you would maybe only expect a small increase there. So that's all well and good. And then it stands to reason we should be able to look at other elements and see something similar. Or if it's different, it's because maybe they behave slightly differently. The next one people looked at, or at least in this exhaustive fashion, uh, is uranium. And they put together an even larger data at several thousand measurements. And here's the data that they generated, paper five years ago. Now, they see this large increase around 600 million years ago. That is really good. Uh, but instead of this stepwise increase here, they actually see this blip between two and a half and two million years ago. 
And they sort of postulated then that maybe we're in fact not looking at a stepwise increase. Maybe there is a transient period of higher oxygen and then it got lower and then it came up again. Anyways, it was an interesting idea. It would be nice to see that supported in other systems. And that's what we tried to do. We picked a third element, selenium. It was the one that the dart hit when they threw it at the board. And we said, let's get several hundred samples together. We actually didn't do it all at once and built, compiled a lot of other data that had been published. And what we saw was this trend, which is another case of this peak here between two and a half and two billion years ago. And then again, the large increase around five to six hundred million years ago. So this all supports the idea, maybe that there is this, this blip here at slightly higher levels and then it got a little lower. Um, but there's more. We followed up on this, and just recently we analyzed some samples actually from that same area in Russia that I showed you the picture at the beginning, and we see this. Uh, in fact, we get to modern or even exceeding modern levels of selenium enrichment, and this is actually also seen in other elements. Now, this is, this is really something interesting. This may be telling us that we are approaching or at basically modern levels of atmospheric oxygen at this time. What this would tell us then is that this curve is a little oversimplified, and in fact, the history of oxygen in its atmosphere looks something like this. And maybe you don't really care if it's this one or the other one. That, why do we? Why is that an important finding? Uh, recall back to this early uh, slide I showed you the history of biological evolution. Here, we used to have this neat story where it was that there was low oxygen, and then it got high enough to cross this threshold, and then there were animals. But now it appears that there's this time where there may have been high oxygen levels, even approaching modern. Now, we can't really say precisely how close, maybe not even within an order of magnitude, but it stands to reason it's approaching modern levels, and we don't have any fossil evidence or chemical evidence of animals being around. And this may have persisted for geological timescales, such that to a remote observer, there's some chance that you could catch us in that state. So what does this mean, then, if we're going to use this as a framework to understand exoplanets. Recall, like Josh mentioned, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch in a few years. We've heard that before, but I think it's going to finally <laughs> launch in a few years. And it's going to capture some photons that come from distant stars, pass through the atmosphere of some exoplanets, beam that data back to Earth, and it may potentially give us something that qualitatively at least tells us something like what this diagram is showing. If you draw your attention to the bottom uh, spectra, this is looking at a stellar absorption that has these bites out of it. These are certain molecules in the atmosphere that are absorbing this outgoing radiation. And in this case, it allows us to detect perhaps oxygen. And as Josh was mentioning, if you can carefully scrutinize the other gases that are present in this atmosphere, you can even describe a biological origin to the oxygen, that would be really cool. We could maybe start to get to the point where we might feel good saying there's life or potentially life on other planets. Now this would require a lot more follow-up work, but let's even say we get to the point where we are certain that it's biological oxygen. There's a caveat here, which is that even very high oxygen levels, like those of the modern Earth, uh, even if they are confidently interpreted as biologically produced, we can't take that as evidence that the biosphere that may be persisting on that planet has complex life as we would define it. Because we now know that there is likely this period in Earth's history where oxygen was fairly high, but we don't think that there are any animals around. Now, that's just one vignette, and I'm trying to now take a, a step back to the bigger, bigger picture and say that that's one thing that studying the early Earth can tell us about the search for life on exoplanets. Um, it, generally speaking, I think this sort of way of viewing Earth's long history is instructive, if not essential, for understanding what we will be seeing in the atmospheres of these distant planets. Because while we do only have a single example, Earth, as the only inhabited planet we know in the universe, uh, in fact, if you look at the four and a half billion year history of Earth, it effectively gives us these alternative Earths, if you will, different faces of an inhabited planet at different points in its evolution. And by studying these and knowing what they look like, we will have a much richer uh, catalog of what habitable planets can, can look like in terms of their atmospheric composition, which will really come in handy when we try to interpret what we're seeing. And so I hope that both this talk and the one before have made the case that 
not only will we need astronomers in this coming uh, era of exoplanet science where we want to say whether any of these planets are inhabited, but I think it will also require collaboration with field geologists, geochemists, geochronologists, so on and so forth to make this happen. And just very last thing I want to close with maybe an inspiring note, which is a uh, something that I heard an astronomer from Harvard say a few weeks ago, which is that only one generation will ever get to make the discovery that there's life beyond our planet. We have the telescopes going up. We have this understanding of Earth's long history coming together. We have the tools at our disposal to make this a reality in the coming decades. And so let's be that generation. Thank you. Please come close if you have a question. All right, so the question is that these events, these increases in oxygen in history, were they perhaps caused by some extraterrestrial event, an impact, or something like that? Uh, the, the prevailing theory is that it is, in fact, an Earth-based cause because the amount of material flux, basically, to get that change to happen requires, we think, perhaps hundreds of millions of years of continued oxygen production and burial of reduced matter. And so it would be hard to conceive of a single extraterrestrial event that could shift the whole system in that way. Um, but if you were to aggregate things like that over time, it, it can be a, uh, some some contribution, but you can stop that's much more smaller than Earth-based causes. So the question was, I focused a lot on animal life, but what about plant life? Is it perhaps even possible that plants producing oxygen preceded the animals that came from the animals and afterwards? Um, something to that effect is very, very likely to be true in two ways. One is not necessarily to do with plants, but with the first oxygen linked photosynthesizers, which are cyanobacteria. Those are essentially required to get oxygen to accumulate in the atmosphere. And something about their evolution either directly or their evolution in their long history of producing oxygen, we are almost certain that the first rise of oxygen, the great oxidation. The second one that I'm showing you, the attainment of modern oxygen levels, that I actually, I didn't go into it here, but the very, very latest thing is that there are two pulses to that. The first one did not quite get to fully modern levels, and we did not reach nearly exactly the modern level that we have today until plants were widespread because they are able to produce much more oxygen and very much more carbon. And that occurred probably 400 million years ago in the plus of it in the development of the That's where the land kind of sort of took off trees and the yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the question, why are the old rocks so scarce and hard to find? The reason, the main reason they are so scarce has to be with Earth's dynamic crust and its ability to recycle itself. So, first thing, anything that's deposited in the deep ocean, oceanic crust, is prone to be subducted. Like when the subduction zone off the coast of um, Cascadia Margin of Washington here, there's oceanic crust going into the earth, it's gone, we're never seeing it again. So none of what we're looking at was on the deep, deep ocean. Some of it's on the continental crust, but the part that's underwater. So of the stuff that stays on the continental crust, that then is prone to erosion. And when things get eroded, it's typically when they are brought up in fiber lake sites, not where the land occurs, convergence of plates. And frequently, there's a lot of potential energy. The stuff wants to get brought back down into marine basins. And so this constant movement, shuffling, recycling, and erosion has removed, basically erased most of the rock record that's ever existed. And it's essentially just luck the things that escape that. Different 
So how do we locate where those places are? Well, this has been, that, that sort of map I put up has been the aggregated work of generations of field geologists going out into the field, we map what is there to get a feel for what types of rocks there are. We don't know the age unless the relative age you can figure out by the uh, succession of what falls below or beneath other rocks. But we don't know the absolute age until we take a sample of that to uh, you can do some sort of geochronology, you measure some uh, isotopic system that decays with time, and we can figure out the absolute age of those rocks. So that map is only possible for decades of getting that. So, questions about why we have seen the spikes in the lemon or the selenium if they are, say, produced by the same stellar nuclear synthetic processes and the and all these things. If the Earth had the same amount of them to begin with, why do we see the spikes at certain times? That just has to do with their mobility on the surface. And so, what it's telling us is that at that point, it's not that the whole Earth all of a sudden has more mobility, it's that more of it is being transported to marine sediments. Whereas before that, it's standing up in that crust. So the question, where is the molybdenum in all these elements before it's mobilized? It is present in different host minerals in the crust. Uh, so most of the gold, the molybdenum and selenium, for instance, are present in sulfide minerals. Also, pyrite being the most common, but you get substitutions of the lithium and selenium and so on. It's highly sensitive to oxygen. Thank you.